inconvenient. That's what I think about the Lord. He's inconvenient. You know, He's loving and kind. He is faithful. He is holy. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. You know these things. Add inconvenient to your list. He says things like this. Sell your possessions and give your money to the poor. He says things like this. Leave your profession and come and follow me. He says things like this. Unless you give up everything you have, you can't be my disciple. He says things like this. No one gets eternal life except through me. Jesus is downright inconvenient. He messes with people's lives. And he doesn't make any apology for that whatsoever. He says things like this. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's downright inconvenient, wouldn't you say? Keeping his commandments isn't easy. Is there anyone in here who feels that keeping God's commandments is an easy thing to do? It's much easier to tell a white lie or to shade the truth than to be honest, at least in the short run. It's much easier to take something that doesn't belong to me, unless, of course, I get caught. It's much easier to trample over other people to get what I want until the consequences of my actions come back to bite me. It's much easier to set aside my, uh, to set my own weekly schedule. This whole Sabbath take a day off thing is downright inconvenient, wouldn't you say? My gosh, who is he? Who is he to tell us to take a day off? Until we realize that our spirit is running on empty and God's gift of the Sabbath is just that, a gift. You know, it's always inconvenient to do what God tells us to do unless we make a connection that Jesus made for us. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. God offers us a relationship whose foundation is love. The result of this love is obedience. When we love Jesus, obeying his commands is not inconvenient. It's just what we do. We would do anything he wants, give whatever he asks, and go wherever he sends us, because that is the nature of love. Amen to that? Well, we'll work on you this morning. Are you with me this morning? You following along so far? One day Jesus was asked a question. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus answered in this way. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Did you catch that last phrase there? All of God's law, in other words, all of the things that he commands us, depend on love. Because God's commands all depend on love, we need to understand a couple of things about these commands. First of all, every command that God gives us is given in the context of his unconditional love for us. Every single one of them. He loves us unconditionally, therefore he tells us what to do. He shows the love that he has for us by inviting him, inviting us to be a part of his family. He is the father and in his family, his word is law. Not in the sense that if we, that he's a, an angry father that wants to catch us doing something wrong. No, he's a good father who wants the best for his kids. New Testament tells us that we are to live as people who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. And so God's giving us his commands is meant to provide us with freedom. The second thing we have to understand is that love is shown and lived out in very specific ways. Just to reemphasize this, Jesus said in another place, John 14, 21, 
Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And so Jesus connects our love with him with our obedience. In other words, to love God means that we need to respond to him in the ways that he prescribes. Now, in this day and age, love means a lot of things to a lot of different people. You hear often people will respond with, uh, for instance, relationships. If, if God loved me, he wouldn't ask me to uh, do this. He wouldn't ask me to maintain a relationship in marriage between a husband and wife because we love each other. You heard that before? God's love, however, is defined by the rules and the commands that he gives. If we love him, then we will keep his commands. His commands provide guidance and protection. They detail the best way to live, which of course God is fully uh, capable and um, qualified to give us because he in fact decided what life was going to be like. He invented it. And so he knows the best way for life to be lived out. Consider this, the car manufacturers tell you to change your oil every three to 5,000 miles or so. If you don't, your car will begin to malfunction, and sooner or later, your engine will blow up. Some of you might have had that experience. I know I have, and it's not a pleasant one. Well, the same thing applies with God. He understands the specifications of how he's made us, and this is why he gives us his instructions. Over the next few months, we're going to take a closer look at God's top 10 instructions. These are the commands which he himself chiseled into stone on Mount Sinai with his own finger. If we are truly people who love God, then we need to understand and obey his top 10. Now this morning, before I talk specifically about the uh, number 10 instruction, it's absolutely vital that we answer this question. What right does God have to tell me what to do? What right does God have to tell me what to do? Now, you may think in your mind this answer. Well, because he's God. He has the right to tell me what to do because he's God. And you would be correct. Because God is the creator of us all, he has the undeniable right to tell us what to do. But there's also a second reason why God has the right to tell us what to do. And that's the fact that he is our savior he has rescued us from the hell which is our sin and the consequences of our sin it is this right that the lord referenced when he first gave his top 10 list to the people of israel the fact that he was the savior of his people who rescued them out of the slavery of the land of egypt and i want to just highlight that for a moment in scripture egypt is a metaphor it's an example that refers to the sinful nature. Now, let me make some comparisons here. The people of Israel were under oppression of harsh taskmasters when they lived in Egypt. And for us today, sin is a harsh taskmaster. It always wants more and gives less. Have you ever noticed that about sin? The Israelites were under the control of a tyrant named Pharaoh. Without Christ, the evil one is the master of our lives, and his mission is to lie, to steal, to kill, and to destroy us. He is a tyrant. The people of Israel were unable to leave Egypt in spite of all of the devastating plagues that came against that land until the final plague. And you remember what that plague was? The sacrifice of the lamb and of the firstborn uh, sons of the land of Egypt. Likewise, until we receive the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the firstborn Son of God Almighty, we are not set free from sin and its consequences. Amen. Once the Lord brought the people of Israel out of Egypt and to his holy mountain, Mount Sinai, he then made a covenant with them that they would be part of his family. And we find this in Exodus chapter 20. I want to invite you over the next several weeks to take a look very closely at Exodus 
chapter 20, because we're going to spend some time in there. We're going to take God's top 10, one at a time. But before God gave his top 10 list, he said this to the people, and he spoke all these words, Exodus 20, 1 and 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God said to his people, Israel, I'm your savior. And likewise today, Jesus says to us, I am your savior. I have brought you out of the consequences of sin. Therefore, I give you my commands. And in the New Testament, Jesus' commands were to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. These two commands condensed together all of God's commands and he condensed together God's top 10 list from Exodus chapter 20. If we love the Lord, then instead of saying to God, don't tell me what to do, our response will be different. It'll be like David as he said in Psalm 119, 97, how I love your law, I meditate on it all day long. So I've set the foundation for us, the reason why we need to obey God's law. Now we're going to go into looking at the specific commands themselves. Number 10 from Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything else that is your neighbor's. Exodus 20, verse 17. Now, I was thinking about the word covet, and I I was trying to think of the last time that I actually used the word covet in a sentence before this week, and I couldn't think of it. How about you? Have you talked with someone and used the word covet? Um, you know, you're, you realize you're coveting that. You ever said that to somebody lately? It's not a word that we use very often, isn't it? So I need to define it for us. And very simply, covet means to desire. That's all it means. It means to desire. Now, when you think about that, the truth is, is that we have all kinds of desires, and they're not necessarily bad, but God's command focuses the desires that we have and makes it very specific. And he says, once our desires turn selfish, that's when the problem begins. That's when the problem begins. We desire all kinds of things. Good friends, a good home, a good job, a good life to live. But when our desires turn inward, and we begin to want the things that we don't have, but others do, then our desire turns selfish and we begin to covet the things that we don't have. But God has a greater purpose for us and greater plan. He desires that we become content with what we have. He desires that we learn to appreciate and to be content with the things that he provides for us. Listen to how the New Testament book of James describes it, the sin of coveting. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. The nature of coveting is when it's our own desire and not the desires of God who has the best in mind for us. Our selfish desire lures us away from home and begins to envy our neighbor. On four different, four different general areas, we envy our neighbor's possessions, like our neighbor's house. We envy our neighbor's relationships, like our neighbor's wife. We envy our neighbor's lifestyle. They have servants and they have animals. We envy our neighbor's belongings, And God says, anything else that belongs to our neighbor. God has given them to our neighbor for a purpose. He hasn't given them to us. And when we begin to envy, when we begin to selfishly desire those things that God hasn't provided for us, we begin to walk down a path. Now, many people consider that this particular sin of coveting is kind of like a second-class sin. 
you know, it's not as bad as murder and adultery and stealing, right? You have a selfish desire, but you know what? I'm not hurting anybody. It doesn't make a difference, does it, right? Well, actually, it does make a difference. And in fact, the same kind of heartbreak and destructive power is unleashed when we covet, when we selfishly desire, as with any other disobedience of God's commands. And so the God who loves us unconditionally wants us to avoid this mess, and so he has warned us to watch out for our desires. Watch our desires. So how does this apply to our lives today? In 1913, Arthur R. Pop Momond created a comic strip titled Keeping Up with the Joneses. Anybody actually seen that comic strip? It ended in 1940, so it's a few years ago. However, you've heard that term before, keeping up with the Joneses. That term became so popular that it has entered into common use today. And keeping up with the Joneses just simply refers to the comparison of one's neighbor to a benchmark for social class or the accumulation of material goods. Coveting is at work when we try to keep up with the Joneses. It is this trap of selfish desire. And this morning, I wanted to highlight very specifically three areas that we fall into the trap of keeping up with the Joneses. Because I think the first thing that we need to do is identify where we do not follow God's command. And once we understand that, then we can begin to respond to it and to follow His word. And so, number one, the entitlement mentality. The entitlement mentality. Here's a definition. An entitlement mentality is a state of mind in which an individual comes to believe that privileges are instead rights and that they are to be expected as a matter of course. The entitlement mentality says, the Joneses have nice stuff. I deserve to have that stuff too without working for it. They need to give it to me. This is the entitlement mentality in a nutshell. Rather than recognizing that providing for ourselves and for our family is a personal responsibility, the entitlement mindset depends on other people or the government to take care of them. Now, don't misunderstand me. There are many who are dependent on others because they are unable to take care of themselves. However, when we can take care of ourselves but expect others to do it for us, the entitlement mentality is at work. Now, I want to give you a description of a study that was done in uh, the years 1979 and 1984 to highlight the entitlement mentality and how it has crept into our society in greater and greater ways. In these years, 1979 to 1984, a study was done by the Public Relations Society of America, and they surveyed whether the public in America was, ha- was experiencing a growing trend of entitlement. The results showed that indeed a trend had sprouted within society, and that more and more citizens were beginning to expect institutions to provide for themselves. The reports detailed that, quote, expectations beginning to surface at the time might have a moderating influence on entitlement attitudes in the future. Now, that quote essentially is saying, watch out, this entitlement mentality is not turning around, it's only getting worse. And isn't this true? The entitlement mentality that we are afflicted with in our society is only growing. Let me give you one specific example. Richard Skidmore is the CEO of Timberlane, a company that makes shutters for uh, iconic clients like Disney and the White House. And here's a quote that he has. Where I come from, there is simply no substitute for hard work and putting in the time. Work ethic to me is about achievement and drive. Being hardworking, persevering, and motivated to win is a prerequisite for business success. Listen to this. Yet finding employees that possess this today has become increasingly rare. 
And this is the testimony of human resources professionals who say that the workforce is increasingly becoming more and more entitled. This entitlement mentality is becoming an epidemic. And coveting is at the root of this entitlement trend. It's one of the stops along the coveting superhighway. It expects to have what the Joneses have without having to work for it. Now, lest you think that I'm picking on people who have this entitlement mentality, I want to flip this around and maybe give you some food for thought that you might not have, have previously thought of. On the other side of the equation, we can also have an entitlement mentality when we are hardworking. Now, let me explain this. When we are hardworking, many times our motivation is because we want what the Joneses have. And instead of being content with the direction and the the will of God in our lives, we begin to do all kinds of of, uh, work. We work hard in order to get something that we don't have just because the Joneses have it. This, too, is an entitlement mentality because when the day is done, this kind of thinking comes back to the same thing. I deserve it. The only difference is that the reason is not people owe me, but the reason is I worked for it. Now, here's why this is the problem. When we equate the pursuit of happiness with the pursuit of money, which gets us stuff that the Joneses have, we have to sacrifice something. And what do we sacrifice? We sacrifice our relationships with one another. We sacrifice our families. And most importantly, we sacrifice what God's will is in our lives. And so the entitlement mentality is pervasive. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. And so God calls us to be people that are content. But the entitlement mentality exists when we selfishly desire what the Joneses have. The next one I want to highlight is called the debt sinkhole. The debt sinkhole. This is what the debt sinkhole says. I'll go to, into debt now to get what the Joneses have because I want it right now. You're all familiar with uh, Dave Ramsey? Dave Ramsey is known for helping people get out of debt through his course, Financial Peace University. I like this quote of his. You may have heard this before. We buy things that we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people that we don't like. Now, isn't that true? That is a snapshot of the sin of selfish desire. Selfish desire is the motivation behind the massive accumulation of debt in our country. But the end result of debt is not actually more opportunity. It is actually less and less freedom. Let me point this out from Scripture. Proverbs 22, 7 says this, The borrower is the slave of the lender. And so when we go into more and more debt, Because we want to have things that we cannot afford, we actually become slaves. We become the slave of the person that we owe money to. The average family today, according to the American Bankers Association, carries about $8,000 in credit card debt. Now that's a lot of money to be spent on interest instead instead of being spent on other things like investing in our future, like providing for the needs of our family, like giving. The debt sinkhole exists primarily because of selfish desire. When we want what the Joneses have and put ourselves into debt to get it, we are the ones who suffer. Now finally, number three, I call the greed monster. The greed monster says this, I'll do anything to get what the Joneses have. I'll lie, I'll cheat, and I'll steal. This past month, it was discovered that Wells Fargo Bank created millions of phony bank and credit card accounts for their customers since 2011. I was especially interested in this because I just took out a loan with Wells Fargo Bank to help pay for college. So I was very, I read these articles with extreme interest this past week. What's going on here? Here's a quote from CNN. 
The phony accounts earned the bank unwarranted fees and allowed Wells Fargo employees to boost their sales figures and make more money. Selfish desire motivated this by greed. The bank agreed to pay $185 million in fines along with $5 million to refund customers. Now let me just highlight There was $5 million that they cheated people out of. How much did it cost them in addition to the $5 million? $185 million. Greed doesn't pay. It absolutely does not pay. A recent report from S&P Global reveals that Wells Fargo is not the only bank to be hit by the greed monster. You see, greed is pervasive in our culture. It is because of coveting. It is because of selfish desires. Selfish desire, you see, is not a second-class sin. It never remains hidden and always leads to pain. Greed sees no problem with cheating people out of their hard-earned money for selfish gain. It, It hides behind slogans like this. That's just the way the game is played. But don't think that greed is only found in corporations. It starts in the small things. And if we feed our greed monster, it will grow up one day and bite us. Money is merely a tool, but when it turns selfish, ethics become optional and people become a means to an end. These problems that I'm highlighting today are epidemic in our society. And let me tell you this, we are not immune to them. Just because a corporation somewhere, someplace, has a problem with greed doesn't mean that we are, we are immune to that problem ourselves. Just because we're not actively trying to buy nice cars and clothes because of other people doesn't mean that we're not affected by that same kind of debt sinkhole or entitlement mentality you see this coveting this selfish desire hits us right where we live we are not immune and so what we need to do is to ask god ourselves in what way in what way does my life need to change so that i can obey you you see the reason why is because we love god that's why we want to change that's why we want to follow his commands it's because we love him and we don't want to do anything that would go against what he asks us to do. And so how do we avoid the trap of selfish desire? The Apostle Paul shows us the way in his letter to the Philippians. This is from Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. And Paul says this, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Therefore, wherever we are at compared with the Joneses, through Christ, we can be content. But we need to watch our desire. The cost of letting selfish desire run rampant is too high to pay. We cannot pay that. You cannot pay that. We cannot afford it. Not financially, not personally, not as a church family. It never leads to God's best in our lives. And so this morning, my charge to us is to watch our desire. In what ways has coveting gained ground in your heart? In what ways have you not been aware that this is a problem in your hearts? I want to give you an opportunity this morning just to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and ask God specifically Is there some way in my life that I have opened the door and I need to shut it this morning? My prayer is for us that God would give us specific ways that we can be obedient to Him starting this week. Would you join me in asking God for that this morning? Our Lord, I want to thank you that that your word is truth. And Father, when when we look at your word and when we meditate on it and when your Holy Spirit brings that word into conviction in our heart. Lord, it's for the purpose of our lives being more reflective of your greatness and your glory. 
and it's the best thing for us. And so, Father, um, instead of looking at your commands and looking at this command to not covet this, this morning as, as something that we're ashamed to even look at, Father, allow us to be those who look at this as an opportunity for us to become more like you and to express our love for you. And Father, for our lives to be more like what you've intended and what you've planned, the best thing, Lord, because you desire the best thing for us. So Father, I ask specifically, if there are areas in our hearts that we have opened the door to coveting, Father, would you reveal them to us right now? Holy Spirit, would you convict us of areas where we need to transition and make some changes so that you can be glorified in and through our lives? Father, we, we ask this so that you would be praised, so that you would be glorified in and through us, in and through this church. Lord, uh, because you are so wonderful and we do love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.